couple Saturdays ago, we had our annual prayer, praise, and proclamation day. And the central theme of it was love, faith, and hope. And so during this year, I'm going to be speaking a lot on hope, faith, and of course on love. And so even though I'm going to be speaking on it today and most likely next Sunday, doesn't mean that's the only time I'm going to be speaking on love. Or the fact that two weeks ago I spoke on begotten to a lively hope because we'll look at it again. As you consider these topics, faith, hope, and love, they are much broader than just what can be covered in one lesson. There are nuances and subtleties that exist with each one, but each one is interlocked. Paul said the greatest of these is love. And as we go through this year, Lord willing, we'll see by the end of the year why love is the greatest. You can't have love, though, without faith. And I contend that without hope, you don't have love. But all three are so, so dynamic in the life of a child of God and that they need to be explored, talked about, and shared. Austin has been dealing with various aspects of congregational growth the last Sunday afternoons of each month. And one of the things that he has talked about is having an ardent love for those individuals that surround us, that we can take the message of hope to them in the fullness of faith, that by and through teaching them, we're trying to get their faith to grow to such a point that they're willing to enact on it. And that by acting on it, it will be a manifestation of true and total love. I want you to go back into the book of 2 John. And in 2 John, you're going to notice the sixth verse. And in verse 6, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This commandment, just as you heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. By using that linking verb, if you will, of is. He's qualifying what love is. And this is love. It is made evident by walking according to the commandment, by obedience, if you would. Now, being a product of the 60s, and I bristle when anybody ever refers to Linda and I as, oh, I hate this word, as hippies. Oh, we were definitely not that. Yes, we did look out of the ordinary. Yes, our lifestyle was different. And yes, I guess I subscribed to the concept of all you need is love. But as I got older, became a little bit more pragmatic, I began to question what love was. And I realized that what was being touted as love really had nothing to do with the true essence of what it is. Even as the Beatles sang, all you need is love. They were clueless, absolutely clueless. And they tried to go to great lengths to find it, going to India, going other places to try to find what love was about, reaching into the inner consciousness, or as the Eastern mystics would say, the Christian consciousness within. I didn't say Christian. I said Krishna consciousness within. Love is not that hard to find. It's not very far from each one of our capabilities. And that's what we're going to see, hopefully in the lesson this morning and building on it over the next week or two. Love is used 348 times in the New American Standard Bible. You'd think a lot more, but no, 348 times, 215 times in the New Testament, and a grand total of 33 times in 1 John, far more than anywhere else, and 22 times in the Gospel of John. So John has become known as the apostle of love, 
He writes about it prolifically, powerfully, and discusses it. He refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved when uh, he writes the Gospel of John. But the interesting thing about love is true love can only be known by the actions that it manifests. Now, I realize a lot of preachers are going to get up and they're going to talk to you about phileo and agape and all of that. I took enough Greek to get me in trouble. Uh, I don't go to the Greek a lot. And yes, there are differences in the words. But there are three words that are actually used in the New Testament, excuse me, in the Bible for love. Phileo, which is that of brotherly love, of affection directed toward, toward another. The agape love, which is the highest form of, of love that one could have. We'll talk more about that. But there's a third. And it's storge. And it's used two times, if I remember correctly, in the entirety of the scriptures. And it's dealing with familial love, where that actual word is there. Now, that doesn't mean that familial love is not seen described. Or discussed in the scriptures. Because it is. But the actual word. Is used very infrequently. So love. What is it? How do you define it? I mean you go into. Merriam Webster's to try to find. A definition. Of love. It's mind numbing. Because love can be a score of nothing which is what Brittany would get when she'd play tennis. 30 love. Oh, you mean you love me? No, it means you got no points, Brittany. Actually, Brittany is a very good tennis player. But it means a score of nothing in tennis. And squash. It means a score of nothing in squash. But we talk about love in so many different ways. Oh, I love my new car. I just love it. We also talk about, I work so hard, I, I really love my free time. Phil talked to us a couple of weeks ago about love of a sexual nature and talked about the parameters therein or an Eros type of love, wherein the word erotic comes from. That's something totally different. But then there is the love of there's the love of self. Narcissism. Oh, man, just, just look at the resplendent person I am. I love me. We can't get enough of me. And we may not go around saying that, but in some of the ways we act toward people, it becomes very evident. I was talking to class this morning about the love I have. For the 12 layer chocolate cake at uh, Claim Jumpers. In all honesty, I've never had it. I've never, ever had it. Brittany's shaking her head. Yes, she's had it. Oh, okay. The Adamses, they've had it, but they didn't invite Brittany. Go figure. <laughs> but we talk about things I love. I love. Why do we throw that word around so greatly? I love entertainment. I love music. Linda and I were talking about it the other day. She goes, you couldn't go a day without noise. You either have to have the TV going or music going. And I said, I could go a day without TV. I don't know that I could go a day without music. And so yesterday, I didn't turn the TV on. I didn't turn music on. And I pointed it out to her after we got back from Costco. And she said, no, 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 no. You, you had music going. I said, when? She said, when you're walking up and down the aisles singing stupid songs to people. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty. Guilty is charged. Uh, my brain is constantly going. And apparently so is my penchant for talking. 
But we talk about all those things as, as things we love. Entertainment, sports, whatever. Is it truly love? And the answer comes back to really no. Because if you look at 2 John 6, what John is saying is love can only be known by the action that it promotes. And if you go over into Romans, the 15th chapter, which you can see on the overhead, and you look at the at verses 2 and 3, John, uh, Paul writes, excuse me, uh, Romans 15, 2 and 3. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But as is written, the reproaches of those who reproached thee fell upon me. Even though the word love is not used there, that is a description of what love is. Because love is characterized by act of goodwill. Because I love Austin, I want only the best for Austin. And I'm going to work to that end to see that the best comes to him. And the same can be true of those that I know and even those that I don't really know. I want only the best. Costco again yesterday. It's this poor woman. And she's bought into the concept that the only kind of water you can have is bottled water in the big jugs. And she was laboring to put it in her cart. And I saw her and I walked over and I picked it up and put it in her cart. And she looked at me and she couldn't believe what I had done. She said, thank you. I really appreciate that. I didn't want that poor woman hurting herself. I don't know her from anybody. But you want the best for people, no matter what they do. Helping others. I tried to get, they were miserly yesterday at Costco with handing out uh, samples. One little piece of candy. And so I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't get one for myself. I said, that lady has 12 kids at home. Give her 12 pieces of candy. And the woman looked at me and smiled. She said, thank you. But I need 15 pieces, please. I appreciated her. But that's what love is. And it doesn't have to be sloppy agape. But it is true and genuine of wanting the best for anyone. And doing what is what is the best for that person? And that's what Paul's trying to get at. But in the 12th chapter of Romans, and we spent considerable amount of time looking at it two years ago on Wednesday night. We dissected the whole 12th chapter and went through it. We talked about how it is, it is a, an outline of what the life of a Christian is to be. And if you look at verse um, 16 down through 21, the writer says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. What he's saying there is, don't be a narcissist. Don't be that. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. That's act of goodwill. I'm not going to injure your person your property, your character. I'm not going to do any of those things. Why? Because I'm trying to do what is right, which is another definition of truly what love is. Act of goodwill. If possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. I have it within my capacity to be at peace with all men. Costco, not yesterday, but other times. And no, I don't live my life at Costco. Just we have people over every once in a while. Anyways, I was at Costco and I was being me, just being me. And some individual took umbrage at it and said some very unkind things. And I could have escalated. And I smiled and went on about my day. The person he was with caught up with me later on in the store and said, I really need to apologize. I said, no, you don't need to apologize. It's all okay. And it wasn't you that did what he did. You don't need to apologize. And the person asked me, well, how is it that you're so nice? And I really 
<laughs> made my stock soar. And I said, I'm a Christian. And that was all that I said and walked away. Nice, polite, wanting only the best. That is at the root of what love is. But he goes on to say in verse 19, never take your own revenge. And then he goes and throws the word beloved. I love that. I, wrong use of the word love. <laughs> uh, but I like that very much. But leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's love. That's love. So he lays it out that way. <clears throat> and then over in the 15th chapter where we've already looked at verses 2 and 3, that's love in action. So love, when you begin to look at it, is really, is really what we're to truly all be about. But now let's get to the root of the matter. Because the origin of love, because quite honestly, mankind did not conceive and originate love. Beloved, John writes in 1 John 4 and verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. 2 John 6, this is love. Now here in 1 John 4, 7, John said, For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. I want you to take that and set it off to the side. Because we're going to come back to that maybe later on in this lesson, if not, definitely next week. We're going to talk about the importance of love and knowing God in love. And the real option is that God knows us and to be known by God because we're characterized by love. See, in John 17 chapter, a lot of great things are really are, are brought out therein. As Jesus, is, uh, as Jesus is praying for the unity of the disciples. And we've looked at it uh, several times in our study on the Holy Spirit. But go into the uh, 17th chapter of the Gospel of John and go with me into verse 26. And uh, notice what is being brought out. And I made thy no name known to them. And will make it known that the love wherewith thou didst love me may be in them and I in them. What Jesus is saying is that the Godhead is joined together and the glue that holds them together is love. The Father to the Son, the Son to the Father, the Son to the Spirit, the Spirit to the Father the spirit to both the father and the son, that dynamic. You remember that little diagram of the, of the three circles? And we talked about deity and the father is not the son, the son is not the spirit, and so on and so forth. But showed that they were all joined together. Well, Jesus here is saying the way that they are joined together is that they are joined together by and through the realm of love. That is the glue that holds them together. The same mind, and that same mind is one of love. And it has been that way since before time. Back in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, the uh, 31st chapter, and down about verse 3. Notice what Jeremiah, under the inspiration of God, writes. The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. The loving kindness. The beauty of it. Love has always been characterized with respect to the Godhead. Has always been, always will be. And God has always striven to make evident his love to mankind. Go back into the book of James. In James first chapter. Go down to the 17th division. 
every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadows the act of goodwill of deity is more than evident as you drove here today the evidence of god's love for mankind was everywhere everywhere you look at the beauty of the flowers. You notice that a lot of the trees now are starting to get into full bloom. Spring's not very far behind us. And people in Minneapolis, i.e. the Odorizzi family, they're buckling under 10 below. Uh, friends that we have in New Mexico, digging out from under snow. Friends, we have in Missouri, bitter cold. Even into the south, it has been bitter cold. Snow as far down as Georgia. Alabama as well. You guys get snow? Okay. That's why we left South Carolina. They got that much snow and the whole, the whole state froze up. Snow. But here we are in the verdant San Joaquin. Uh, San Joaquin. San Fernando Valley. And we can see the beauty of God's creation. We're going to talk a lot about it. Because that is a manifestation of the love of God. Go into the book of 1 John. And uh, in 1 John, go into the fourth chapter. 1 John 4 and uh, go into verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. When you think of deity, love is the predominant thought. The very nature of deity, whether it be the Father, the Son, or the Spirit, is one of love. And that deity is joined together by and through love. Go back into the Gospel of John, 17th chapter. I know we were in uh, 26 earlier, but drop up, go back up into verse 24. And uh, notice what's seen in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, in order that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou didst love me before the foundation of the earth. Now, stop and think of that. Before time was even created, that's hard to think of in the first place, but before time was created, the father had a love for the son and apparently as well for the spirit. There's no variation with deity. That love existed and held deity together before anything. That was love. Now, stop and think for a moment. That the father out of love for mankind, for his creation, sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. His son, who could easily be said, was the eternal delight of his eye. He sent him on our behalf as a gift of love. That is remarkable. That's how much God loved us. And that is why it's important that we keep in context the love of God and the love that holds the Godhead together and where love comes from. And it comes from God because God is love. Have you ever seen a parent with the absolute love in their eye for their child? 
I just saw it 15, 20 minutes ago. Jacob was holding Isaiah. And you could just see it in his eyes. The love a father has for his son. It's impressive. It holds them together. It's what causes Jacob and Amelia to get up and to, to do the things they do. Because of their love for their children. It's all done for the children. And that's what the father did for us. That's where love comes from. And that the divine Godhead is bound and together in love and brought about the scheme of redemption. Scheme is not a bad word. there. The plan of redemption for mankind out of love. And it was planned before time even was. That's what Paul talks about in Ephesians first chapter beginning in verse 3 and continuing on down through 10. Well, for that matter, you, in all reality, throughout the entirety of the letter. That God had a pattern and plan that's centered around love. So the one who does not love does not know God. For love is from God. So when you think about love, you've got to, you've got to bring it into every, every facet of what you do in your life. Now, how is the love of God exemplified? The psalmist, back in Psalms 19, starts out in verse 1. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Have you ever seen pictures of nature and said to yourself, that's got to be Photoshop? No, it wasn't. You mean nature can be that beautiful? Absolutely. I was watching the news last night, and they were showing the L.A. flower mart and all the beautiful plants and flowers that are there. The colors were bright and vibrant. The subtlety of each flower was extraordinary. And I just couldn't help but sit and look in rapt wonder at what it is God created. I'm, I have a kindly affection. Didn't say love. I have a kindly affection for bird of paradise flowers. To me, they are beautiful beyond description. They showed several of them. When I drive down the street, I pay attention to them. They're magnificent. That is one tiny little part of God's creation. You drive north from Cambria up to Monterey. The beauty is beyond description. Arguably one of the most beautiful drives in the entirety of the world. That's the telling of God's love. That he created all of this for us. And he has made that love evident in so many ways. Yeah, Psalms 19, first six verses celebrates the creation. Absolutely celebrates. It. But then when you stop and really contemplate how much God loved us, it defies description. I did not know that Gloria Odorizzi painted. I didn't know that. And I know the Odorizzi family fairly well. I didn't know it until we had her memorial a few weeks ago. I did not know that Ann Joseph painted until we moved her. And I look at the works that they were able to paint, the beauty that they were able to create. I know my wife paints. And I look at the beauty she paints. She paints in a total different medium than Gloria or Anne. Each one different. And I realize that God gave us the ability to create beauty on our own. That individuals have the gift of, of, of being able to paint. 
individuals being able to create, to build, to think, to reason, to create sculptures. God gave us that ability. And that is part of the love that he has for us. We are the highest of God's creation. Oh, yes. Bees can make a hive. Animal, uh, ants can burrow. And uh, it's kind of fascinating to get an ant farm and to watch them dig around in there. But nothing compares with what we can do. And that is a gift given to us by God. And God has given us a law that allows us to approach him, that allows us to come before him. And truly, that's magnificent. But just stop and think what we have the capabilities of doing. And that's because of the love from God that mankind can so examine the body that they can devise ways to get us out of pain, to heal us. Ask Kathy what she thinks of nerve ablation. Ask her, and she'll tell you. Nerve ablation simply is the ability to go down with radio frequency and short circuit the nerves that are bothering her. In cardiac ablation, Doctors go in and they use radio frequency ablation to turn off various irregularities with the electrical impulse in your heart. God gave us out of love the ability to think and create and do those things. And we don't think about it. We tend to think surface. We, we don't really sit back and really contemplate the depth of what God's done for. Israel really didn't think about it. I mean, they took it all for granted. And God made his love evident to them time and time and time again. Go back into Jeremiah. And let's refresh our memories there. Go into Jeremiah 31st chapter. And verse 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. There I have drawn you with loving kindness. God was reminding him all the way through, I've, I've really loved you. I've loved you. And I've proved it over and over and over again. It's one of the songs out of the Great American Songbook. I'm confessing that I love you. Over and over and over again. You listen to the songs out of that song quote unquote song. And it talks about love so often. And talks about the various ways that love is made evident. I may not be as uh, vocal about love for my family, but I like to think that they know that I love them. Because for 50 years, I've gone to work every day. For 50 years, provided every way that I could. That says love. God is saying he loves us each and every day by the things he put in place. We need to open our eyes and see where love is about. And the children of Israel needed to do the same. Look back at the book of Micah for Malachi. In Malachi... We're going to go into the very first chapter. We're going to go down to verses 2 and 3. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how has that loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob. But I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation. And appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Yeah, I loved you. And I also showed my disdain for those that didn't show love in return. I provided you so amply. And I provided it out of love. 
in Hosea, the 11th chapter, verse 1, again, is a testament of how God had made evidence his love uh, for the children of Israel. So you go into the 11th chapter of Hosea, and you look at verse 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, there's a little bit of prophecy there as well. But basically, the statement, from the youth up. Now, that tells you when you really love someone. When your kid finally goes into the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, yikes. That's when they get teeth, so to speak. They begin to feel their oats. And you still love them, even through all of that. And God said, I loved you through all of that. And I still love you. In the 16th chapter of Ezekiel, God points out how Israel had treated him. And that he had loved her no matter what. And basically said, you know what? I still wait for you to come home. I still wait for you. I still long for you to come home. Why? Because I love you. I love you. The story is told of a man who married a woman. He loved her greatly. He did everything he could for her. But she went and became very wanton. And he knew that one day he was going to get the phone call. That she'd been in an accident or something bad had befallen her. And he would call and try to find where she was. And finally the day came. Her life was taken from her. And what he had done was he had called the various mort mortuaries in town. That whenever her body showed up, they were to call it. And so he went down. He made all the arrangements. And they said, what do you want put on her headstone? And through tears, he said, this is what I want written. No matter the expense. If only you knew how much I loved you. You would have come home. And that was it. And see, that's what God wants for us. That's what God wanted for Israel under the Old Testament. That's what he was telling them in Jeremiah and Hosea and elsewhere. Look at all I've done for you. And if only you knew how much I loved you, you would have come back to me. Well, you go into the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, into the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. I, it's not dead. It's not ended. <clears throat> I can bring you back to life. I love you. And then throughout the Old Testament is the pointing to the Messiah. And it's all being done out of love. All out of love. And then ultimately, ultimately, God sends forth his son out of love so that we would know just how much he did indeed love us. Look at 2 Peter, third chapter, and we're going to leave this as, a, as kind of a pregnant thought, if you would, a kind of a hook to set us up for next week. But in 2 Peter, the third chapter, Notice what Peter writes, verse 9. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God loves us. He does not want any of us to come up short of the mark. Act of goodwill. Act of goodwill. And so that's where we'll pick it up beginning, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. Talking more about the way God manifested his love. But now, directly toward us. Saw toward Israel and kind of a, uh, a, a, an application in a broad sense. But now we're going to see the supreme manifestation of God's love. Now, are, have we got into the into the 
details of man's love for man and so on. No, but we'll get there. But we need to understand first just how much God loved us and to realize that the promise that God made has been realized and has been fulfilled. Well, the lesson is yours this morning. Trust that it's helped you see love in just a little different way. Because when we use the word love, we use it all sorts of different ways. All sorts of different ways. Last Sunday, after we left here, we went out to lunch. And some of those that went out to lunch together were talking about, where we're going to lunch today? Plan it a week ahead. And somebody mentioned a restaurant and then said, oh, I love that restaurant. Well, that's, man, yeah, I, I understand what you mean. But that's what we do with words. We do that all the time with words. Let's not play fast and loose with the word love. Let us truly understand what it means. And when we say, I love you, let it be known by the actions that we take. And if we do that, you won't have to say you love you enough. It'll be seen in all that you do and all that you're about. If you love God and you haven't obeyed his word, you really haven't loved God. Because love is obedience to the commandments. And what God has promised us and told us is if you'll obey, I'll forgive you your sins. I'll adopt you into my household. I'll add you to the kingdom of my son. But you need to repent of your sins. You need to make the good confession of Jesus Christ before man. And then, yes, be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. Therein is love. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, greater love is no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do as I command you. Love in action. Love personified. Love actualized.